Welcome to the Biz Bash podcast, where we make biz strategy a piece of cake. I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Cammie, but you might know us better as Eliza and Calligraphy and Cammie Monet. We want to help you, our fellow stationers, artists, and calligraphers, confidently build a profitable and personality-driven creative biz. We're here to share our honest-to-goodness advice and actionable strategies for ambitious artists. So put on your party hat, quit being a procrastinator gator, and let's get this party started. Hey y'all, welcome back to the Biz Bash Podcast. It is Q and Cake, lucky number 13 today. Woo! Okay, so as you guys know, Q and Cake is our version of Q&A where we just kind of get questions from you guys and then we answer them in this podcast. I know, it makes sense. Um, I haven't read the questions, so now I'm getting all sweaty thinking about it. But we're going to never that. really do, though. This is all about winging it. I know. I usually always read them just to be like, okay, I have my thoughts kind of gathered, but I legitimately have not read them. And oh, I'm sweaty. I'm cold, but I'm sweaty. I got problems today, you guys. Like my fingers are cold. My armpits are sweaty. I don't know what's happening. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Focus on that. <laughs> okay. Today's one of those days where I'm like, I just like want to be on the couch and watch Will and Grace and not do anything because I'm coming off a three-day weekend. I know that you worked yesterday, Cami, but I definitely took Good the day. day off because Will had it off too. Yep. That's Martin Luther good. King Jr. Day. Yes. Well, I, um, I'm going out of town this week, so I didn't think I should take the day oh, off. Oh, yeah. Monday. Obviously. That makes On sense. Wednesday. So I needed to get some stuff done before I left. I had like a list of like, these three things have to get done and I've done two. So I got to do the other thing <laughs> later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but oh, anyway, also, yeah, I decided in 2020, I am not going to say, let's dive in because I am just noticed so many podcasts say it. I'm sick of diving in. So we're not going to do any diving. So I'm going to say something else. Let me think. Something. Okay. So late New Year's resolution. We're not saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever say that though. It's me. Well, yeah. If I introduce something like, let's dive in and then it's just it's so annoying. So <laughs> I'm going to say. Let's mosey into this conversation, and I'm going to ask the first question. Are we ready? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this one is from Elizabeth with an S, just like you, of at Raise Your Words Lettering. And Elizabeth asks, what suggestions do you have for an imitation designer who is not particularly skilled with watercolor but wants to offer venue illustrations or pet portraits for customers? Are there vendors who I can outsource this to, or would you advise me to learn the art myself? Thank you. Okay, I feel like I feel like a lot of us inherently think that like watercolor is like the one or only thing you can do. But <laughs> I, I will say because I've struggled with this personally because I've told Cami before, I'm like, it's just like my watercolor is not that great or like watercolor is like not my thing as much. But that's why I freaking do my like a lot of my like venues and and illustration stuff anymore on the iPad. <gasps> gasp um there you go. <laughs> pull out a paint palette guys like the Salzburg Austria map I did that was all procreate but it was done in a way where it very much looked it still looked like hand-painted art like not necessarily like graphics so if you are a stationary designer though who wants to offer these things and you just don't feel super confident about it, there are definitely people you can outsource to. And I know we have a bunch in our community online, right, Cami? Yes, we do. People um, post in there for referrals all the time. Basically, you're licensing your artwork to other stationers um, or working with other artists. I'm sorry. I'm thinking in terms of my way. <laughs> like I would be licensing the artwork. But if you're a stationer and you're like, oh, I don't know how to get this watercolor thing, then you can totally reach out to other artists and work with them. So it's all about just making those connections with other artists so you can begin that licensing process. But yeah, that's totally a thing. And it's totally okay to do that. I think as long as you're just upfront with saying, hey, I'm not going to paint this, but we're going to hire so and so to do it for us, you know, and when you're like, you need to make sure you're giving the artist credit as well when you do show the suite, et cetera. But yeah, you can totally do that. You don't have to create everything yourself for the suite. And if it's something that's like more generic, you can always get watercolor stock art from Creative Market. Um, what's another sh- site that has stock art? I don't know. Creative Market's the one I think of right away. Oh, there was another one, but my brain's not firing quite yet, you guys. But anyway, yeah, you can totally um, get some stock art and do that or work with another artist so yeah don't even worry about it you can't if you have no artistic ability but you're just a really good designer you can totally work with other artists it's totally yeah. fine 
Agreed. Like a great example of this is um, Empress Stationery, and they do all these beautiful custom suites. And when they have a watercolor venue or pets, those are most likely done by artists out of house. So like Simply Jessica Marie, like her artwork has definitely been on Empress Stationery suites before because of a relationship like that. Yeah. And I work with a lot of other stationers doing crest and venue illustrations and licensing that out to them. So yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I will read the next one. Okay. Uh, This is from Morgan of Morgan Harris Design. And she says, I'm a stationer. I've followed both of you for a long time and greatly admire your work and your helpful resources. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) Currently, (laughs) I'm an art teacher while also working on my stationary business. Teaching is very stressful, but I feel I have to do this in order to make income. I'm not making what I need to make with my stationary business, but I feel my prices need to be lower in order to generate business at this point. Most of my clients are local and I struggle with raising my prices any higher than they are. Any help? Can you direct me in the right way? Oh, man. Hit me with a pricing question right out of the gate. Well, I think you guys probably know our philosophy on pricing and that most of stationers in our industry are not charging enough for their work to actually be making a profit. So this is going to come down to like looking really hard at your numbers and like making sure that your profit margin is more than you know, most stationers are around 20%, 30%. You want to be in more like the 60 to 80% range for your profit margin. Um, And so you might feel like locally, my clients aren't going to pay this or just no way that I can compete. But maybe it's time to expand your market, not just locally, but expanding it into brides who can't afford your services. So just like thinking outside your local market, because as a stationer, you do have the privilege of being able to work with people all over the place, um, which is really nice. And um, just looking for those clients who can afford those prices. And if you feel like your work isn't quite at that market yet, then it's time to start shifting your aesthetic and your um, the look you really want to portray for those high-end clients and just making sure that you're tailoring everything to that. Does that make sense, you guys? I feel like I went on a kind of a ramble there, but full circle, yeah. bring it around. You need to elevate your style, elevate your value, and like understand that you do have like an amazing talent and offering. So you can raise those prices. Like don't get stuck thinking that those clients won't pay it when you haven't even tested the market yet. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. My biggest thing is definitely on the point that Cammy said is go beyond local. Like if you feel like being only local is blocking you in with what you can charge, then you need to be appealing to a wider audience. So however you um, navigate that is up to you. But like working on your SEO and your website can help with that a lot to attract people from different parts of the country. But I was going to say too, that if you do want to cater to those local people and you want to keep your business local, you might want to think about your business structure as well. If you are trying to get into these higher end weddings and you want to charge a lot more for your stationery, but you don't feel like the local market supports that, then what can you be offering to the local market that does? So this is an instance where having like three collection suites could be really helpful. So when people inquire with you, you can say, hey, these are my three go-to suites that I have like with my artwork, whether they're florals, whatever they are. They're this price range, but if you want something entirely custom from me, it's this price range, and then you present your higher price point as well to let them choose, and then that way, that gives those local people the choice instead of immediately saying no right off the bat if those custom prices aren't in their range. I don't know. What do you think, Cammy? No, I think that's really smart. Like, you know your local market the best and, like, what's going to work for them there. So, yeah, if you really want to work those local brides, I definitely think having that lower price offering where you're not putting as much, you're not so hands-on, right? You know, you can just, like, um, get those out the door quickly. It's definitely a good idea so that you're not just, like, losing business on that. Um, But Mm -hmm. at the same time, also, um, if you are scared to raise prices, just keep in mind that if you're raising your prices, you only have to work with one client instead of three or four. Um, So you are getting like higher value per client. So you don't need to book quite as many. So just something to keep in mind. (laughs) Yep, definitely. Like I would say that booking is definitely like fewer and far between like when you have much higher pricing. But then when you book one, you're like, oh, wow, this is amazing because I did all that legwork. <laughs> and now I've like booked someone way higher instead of like booking six people at $1,000 each, I booked one person at 6000 Yeah, And that makes your life a little easier. So 
it's up to you. You'll definitely just need to continue to reflect on that and how you want your business to look and how you want to balance your life, especially because I'm friends with a lot of teachers. So I understand to a point uh, what you're going through and like, that's no joke. So (laughs) kudos to you for working on that and, and having your own business on the side with that profession. Yeah, that's freaking incredible. Also, a little shameless plug here, you guys. We do a lot of in-depth talk about pricing in um, the Stationer Summit. We have an entire pricing session. It's almost two hours long of us explaining the ins and outs of how to um, really raise your prices and get paid your worth and actually make a profit in the stationary industry. And I'm just going to say, if you want to get on the waiting list for the Stationer Summit, it's stationersummit.com. You can just get on the waiting list. Wink, wink. <laughs> okay. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Wink, yeah, wink, do wink, it. nudge. Do it. <laughs> um, okay, moving on. I will ask this question because okay. it doesn't apply to me at all. Okay, so this is from Nikki at Lavender and C. So she asked, do you have an iPad? If so, how do you utilize it for your business? Hello, I have an <laughs> iPad. I don't. This morning, I was watching Will and Grace, and that's how I use it for my business. Um <laughs> Um, I mean, I do watch shows on it and stuff sometimes while I'm doing things, but the biggest thing on the iPad is Procreate for me um, and the ability to like sketch things out and create artwork on there has been totally revolutionary for me, especially with like spot calligraphy and a couple things like that. It can be done so much quicker. So true confessions though, true confessions of an Apple addict. Um, <laughs> I bought an iPad back in, let's see, that would have been like May of 2018, March to May kind of area of 2018. And by the end of 2019, so like the very end of this last year, I was like, the iPad's not enough. And I bought a laptop as well. So what I discovered was like a lot of my workflow and like email and using Dubsado and doing bookkeeping and using Illustrator and Photoshop and those types of programs. Like if I wanted to be on the go, I needed to have a laptop that could do all of those things for me because the iPad is so great for like art creation and being a part of my workflow, but it was not enough on its own. Um, So I would say if you're like interested in creating more art on the go and doing some artwork that's not on like traditional pen and paper, then getting an iPad could be an awesome addition to your business. And it's hard because you like never know until you add it. But they have a return policy, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, here in the <laughs> Miller house, we return everything. So, <laughs> um, yeah, oh, I've just been like debating so hard on like if I should get an iPad or not because, well, I would not use it to replace my watercolor artwork because that's just ain't gonna happen. Like, I don't know. But for like sketching out, you know, and I do like my sweet sketches and stuff instead of like doing them pen and paper and scanning them in and stuff. I'm like, maybe it'd be so much easier to just do it on an iPad and like replacing that part of my workflow. But I'm like, does it justify the cost to (laughs) do this? Yeah. Like this one part of my process that I'm probably not going to use it for anything else, really. I don't know. Yeah. And it's a learning curve. Yeah. It's all a learning curve with new technology. And so I will say that. Like what I've realized is that my first sketches, like my initial ideas and thumbnails and just like out there sketches always need to be on paper first. So I do like some rounds on paper and then I start getting this like idea of like, okay, this is how I want the suite to come together and how I want to present the sketch to the client. Mm -hmm. And that's when I move over to my iPad because it gives me the ability to like draw shapes. Like you can draw like a perfect square or rectangle and like move that around And then you can do like layers and move things. And it kind of helps with that part of the process because then I export that to Photoshop and I make even more tweaks in there. Um, Cammy, you'll be so impressed. Like all those sketches I showed you for the Cabo suite, like a lot of that finagling was done in Photoshop. I didn't even put any of that stuff in Illustrator. (laughs) I'm so proud of you. Oh my gosh. You'll also be impressed with me because this weekend I took like a two hour mini InDesign course so I could create my wholesale catalog. I thought <gasps> it myself. I know. Oh my gosh. I, I, be so of you. <laughs> I learned so many like nifty little tips and tricks. It was just like a YouTube video. Like this guy. It's the best, you guys. You can learn anything from YouTube. Totally YouTube great. is amazing. I well, know. I'm very excited for you because you've been yeah. needing to create that for a while. So I know. <laughs> uh, Nikki, hopefully that answers your question. I have one. Cammy's on the fence. Which one I did actually have? uh what size? 
Oh, I have like the 13 inch for sure. I have the bigger okay. one. Mine is not like the newest version, but I will say that was at the very end of the year in December. Yeah. So I had, I got like the Apple care on it because it's smart to do that. So I had like Apple care for two years and it was starting to give me some issues. So in December, I like took it into the Apple store and they straight up gave me a brand new one. So that was cool. <laughs> yeah. I was like, dang, I would have taken the issue one, but it obviously doesn't work like that. <laughs> yeah. I know. I felt bad saying bye to the other one. Cause I was like, you've served me so well, but you're being such a problem child. It was like, yeah, it wouldn't respond to touch certain times or it would get like stuck or frozen or yeah there was just like too many weird funky things happening so I took it in before my warranty was like up this spring and yeah. got a brand new one so that is the nice thing about the like apple products and apple care yeah. that they have pretty good policies in place for that that is nice yeah I was like playing around with an ipad at best buy because I was like okay I'm gonna figure out I'm just gonna like play around with procreate like trying to use the apple pencil it looked freaking horrible you know <laughs> And some guy, you know, they always are like asking for help. And I was and the guy was asking me like what I would use for. I was like, oh, I'm really interested in possibly using it for like sketching and artwork. And he was like, well, what kind of artwork do you do? And Alex was standing next to me. He's like, let me just show you your Instagram. So he like show Alex was like showing him some of my artwork. And he's like, you did this on the iPad? I was like, no, that's watercolor. He's like, it looks like you did it on the iPad. I was like, it does? <laughs> I was so confused. And he, he was like confused. I was confused. Everyone was confused. I was like, no, it's like watercolor. It's like real paint. And he like did not understand <laughs> Um, probably because, because the background is in. The background, yeah, so clean. Scanned it in. That's yeah. why. Yeah, and like the background was clean, and so like he was very confused. But we finally like got him to understand after I like showed him some other pictures, like my hands in it, you know. <laughs> but like, yes, he was confused. I was like, "What do you mean? No, it's not done on the iPad." I was like, "If it was done on the iPad, I wouldn't be here looking at the iPad trying to figure it out." All right, <laughs> like you seem to be writing with it. You think I did that? Like, come on. But anyway, that's my little iPad story at the end. <laughs> uh, that's so funny. Yeah, I, I get it, though. In terms of like a generation gap, when someone sees something he was scanned younger. in yeah. digitally. <laughs> he was younger? I mean, he was younger than me. He's probably like 22. Like he was, you know. Oh, okay. Well, still, okay. So generation gap in the other direction. Oh, because I was thinking anymore, like, okay. <laughs> but yeah, but like young kids, if they see something that's a picture like in a digital format, they probably assume it's done digitally. Like yeah, yeah. the concept of like doing something in a physical format and then like scanning it in might not be is yeah i don't know exactly. like yeah that's revolutionary like every day and so old school with my style <laughs> oh. um okay i can read the next one okay and this is of Sean of AC Letters Calligraphy. And she asks, I got into calligraphy as I loved making physical homemade items in such a digital world. Ha, huh, that was what we were just oh! talking about. <laughs> um, however, it does seem like the best way to make passive product income is by digitizing. How did digitizing items to print onto products impact your company? And where did you learn to digitize your work? And so I'll, I'll let you start this one, Cami, because you do digitize a lot of your watercolor. Okay, yeah, I think I'd have to like wrap my head around. I think she just means more like scanning stuff and like duplicating it, basically, just like being able to scan your artwork and create products from that. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause I guess we should define that like passive income is normally like products are normally not considered passive. Yeah. However, you can sell something more than once if you digitize it. And I think that might be what yeah. she's asking. Um, this will literally be a game changer for your business. If you're someone who's literally just doing everything custom, everything by hand, every single order you take is brand new and you have to start from scratch and you never resell it again, you are losing money in your business and you are setting yourself up for failure in the long run because you never have a way to scale or like if you're not there and you're, what if your hand gets broken or something? I don't know. I always go back to like broken limbs <laughs> in this podcast. I don't know why. <laughs> um, so when you're able to actually scan in and reproduce your work, you can easily scale and start selling that artwork piece Many, many times, hundreds of times, so you can like keep making more and more money. So it's not that hard to digitize. I learned um, by taking Modern Calligraphy Summit, literally watched Ashley Buzzy's section on digitizing like 50 times before I finally figured it out and just playing around in Photoshop. But like I was just saying, I took a, that YouTube course this weekend just about InDesign. You can find courses on there on how to digitize your lettering, your artwork, and um, begin that process and just kind of teach yourself. That's the best way to do it. That's the way I learned. Um, and once you do that, then you need to join the A to Z directory and we will tell you where to print all your stuff and how to actually get it on things. But 
I truly think to be successful as an artist, you need to learn how to scan your artwork and um, be able to do that. Before I was able to do that, I was working with a local print shop and I would take my regional artwork to them and they would scan it in for me. And it was like 10 bucks for every scan and they would keep it for like two weeks. Like it was like the slowest process of all time. And I couldn't edit any of the scans. Like I, I could say like, oh, I don't want this and I want the color to be a little bit more vibrant, but they of course, like don't understand exactly what I'm saying. So I would never get the scans exactly right and always drove me crazy. But um, they can't read my mind. So you have a lot more control of the end product of your artwork as well if you're doing that yourself versus hiring someone. So a little food for mm-hmm. thought on that. But yeah, it's it's definitely not as difficult as it seems. I know Photoshop is super intimidating, but there's really only like three things you need to know to digitize your artwork. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's very true. And definitely make sure that you have Photoshop. (laughs) That'll be a huge key to to your success. But even for wedding invitation suites, we have to digitize our artwork all the time. So yep, it comes into play in a lot of different ways. Um, Doing truly passive income for digitizing would be like something on creative market if you like ever sold your artwork as a set. Like some people sell their watercolor Digital downloads on Etsy or something, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of thing. That would be truly passive. Which I have totally thought about doing stuff like that before, Cammie. Just like painting a bunch of random things and being like, and here's my clip art pack for like $5. Why not try it? Like... I don't know. I don't. I've I thought about that too, but I'm like, no, I don't. I feel like it's gonna like cheapen my brand. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your stuff is like way too high end. Whereas I could like whip up something that would be super, super quick. Or like, I love what Audrey of Brush and Barley has done because she does all these like clip art packs and yeah. buy them off her Etsy all the time, and it's so cool because it's like 100 percent passive. She just like puts them up there, then people download them and like use them on their pictures and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. how brilliant. <laughs> I know. I, but I, I understand like how she's like, I love making like physical homemade, like working with my hands and like you can still do that. It's just like a way to scale your business even further. So, I mean, and like my dad, he does all his paintings. He has no idea how to scan anything in. I mean, he barely knows how to like write a complete sentence with his iPhone. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he works with a print shop and they scan his artwork in, but theirs are like go through like 10 rounds of color testing and like it's a lot of back and forth to get a print for him. Like versus mine are a lot more like quick and easy <laughs> and but his, he's like in a whole nother sphere like fine art sphere so um but obviously like that's been a huge proponent of his business as well is getting selling the prints versus just selling originals so yeah and they still have like he still has his like art studio and shop right they haven't yeah. transitioned away from that no they still have it so okay for some reason i thought i had remember them saying uh, they've, been, they've been trying to sell it but i don't know my dad wants to build like a studio um out at the farm so we could just have a smaller studio out there and oh, just be out there cute. and paint and like us just make like fun little products for the farm and like have all my cards there like it'd be really cute just to like i don't know he just wants to simplify a little bit but yeah i don't know i also think like they haven't sold it yet, but they haven't found the right buyer. And I also think they're kind of just like holding on to it because they really love it. too. <laughs> so Yeah, they really love know. it. And your parents are still so spunky and full of life. So I it's know. not like they have to sell it. It's not like it's like a burden. No, I don't feel that way. So <laughs> they just kind of like, oh, so we'll see. But anyway, yes, learn how to digitize your artwork. It's kind of, I think it's a must if you're in this industry personally. <laughs> yep. Agreed. Okay. You'll, you can read the last one. It's oh, for me. <laughs> you put a question for you? Okay. Um, for Elizabeth, this is from Sierra of Studio um, Del Alma. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure if what – hold on. I think, yeah, Studio okay. Del Alma. I'm like, wait, looking. I'm getting so close to my computer screen to make sure I'm reading right. It's right. Studio of the – something i'm so sorry I need you to know how just something. like words go together and sometimes you pronounce them wrong because they're just jammed up anyway sierra asked this to elizabeth can you describe how you moved from doing mostly wood signs to doing custom invitation suites also how do you balance the two audiences you have of serving creative entrepreneurs and serving brides which do you feel like is your true focus when you think about where you want your business to go in the next 10 or 15 years oh elizabeth that's a good one for you. <laughs> I know. Well, there's a lot for both of us to talk about here for sure. And by the way, I looked up Alma and that is soul in Spanish. So her Instagram is Studio of the Soul, Studio del Alma and Sierra. I love that. That is awesome. I love this so much. Like I just got chills. I think it's really cool. 
<laughs> I was like, I know it's studio of the something and oh gosh, I need to brush up on my other languages. Um, anyways, so moving from wood signs to custom invitation suites. So that was like a big kind of leap of faith. First of all, I will say by the end of 2018, I was like absolutely exhausted of wood signs. I just could not handle it anymore. And it was like, I like dreaded doing them. And that was also, I'm pretty sure 2018 was also the year when I did pinners. Wasn't it, Cami? I'd have to go uh, back. I think so, yeah. Year and review. But that was when I like cut and stained like 200 wood signs for like the class I did. And then it was super traumatizing because I had so many left over. <laughs> Didn't know what to do with all of them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> so it's just like, I was living out of a two bedroom apartment at that time. And so it was like the second bedroom was my studio, but it was like so much was being taken up by the wood signs. And so I decided at the end of the year, I was like, I'm retiring from this. Uh, bye bye. Also, so much of my time was being spent doing those like the day of things and the signage that I didn't even have room in my business to like discover where I wanted to go in terms of like direction for custom wedding invitations. Yeah. So I basically made an announcement on Instagram and it's still one of my favorite posts because I talk about like, hey, I've loved my like basically like three years of doing wood signs and it's an art form that I'll always, of course, like value and appreciate. But, you know, my time doing this has come to a close as I want to focus on doing custom invitation suites. So at that point, it just came about putting the boundary up, um, which is still hard to do because I will have like family friends even to this day that ask about wood signs for their weddings. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like I, at the end of 2018, I like stopped doing those completely, but I have other names for you. Um, and so I had a couple of custom invitation suites booked for 2019 at that point, And I booked a couple more later. Um, but also like 2019 was like the year of doing the stationer summit for Cami and I. <laughs> so I didn't like put a ton of focus on my custom invitation suites like as much as I could have. But I would say that I got lucky in that regard that we did something as big as the Stationer Summit because that really like balanced out what my income and revenue looked like. And so there wasn't a ton of pressure for Eliza and Calligraphy to do like huge weddings or like a ton of invitation suites because I had this like supplemental revenue essentially from biz birthday bash that was like paying me um <laughs> am i even answering this question am i'm I just, just letting like, you go yes you are answering it you are answering it <laughs> carry <laughs> on <laughs> so anyways it was about the boundary just taking a step back you have to have the guts to be able to do it and to tell yourself this is what i want to do so i actually consider 2019 like my quote-unquote first year of wedding invitation suites even though i had been doing them prior to that i hadn't been like solely doing them until this past year Okay, so I feel like we can move on to like the next part of this question, which is how the heck do you balance two audiences you have of serving creative entrepreneurs and serving brides? And Cami, I'm going to let you start on this one because I just talked like three minutes straight and I need to drink some water. So, okay, well, this question says for Elizabeth, so I'm just sitting back. I'm just kidding. I'll answer. <laughs> it's just my point on the first part of the question. And then <laughs> oh. It said also, like they were all after her. I <laughs> Um, no, I feel like these last two questions are totally applicable to both of us. Yeah, this is true. Okay, so balancing the two audiences. Well, you know, I think now we have the businesses so separated out. Like, it's very clear. My business is Cameron Monet. The um, education business is Biz Birthday Bash. Like, there is two businesses. And I think having that distinction is very important in terms of balancing. And if, like, if you're someone who is thinking about doing a little bit of both, I do think at some point it might be helpful to like split those. Uh, however, that being said, I do think you can also keep it under the, the same name if it's like, like if I'm doing like watercolor classes, like that's still like the creative side. So I would keep under my business, if that makes sense. But in terms of like balancing the business, like with my brain, oh my gosh, like my brain gets so crazy <laughs> trying to think of things, but it really is just like compartmentalizing things and I'm very much like I have to be like, okay, I am 100% Cami Monet today and I'm doing all creative artwork um, and only wedding invitations today. And then tomorrow I'll be like, okay, so today is podcast day. I'm switching gears completely. Like literally, like for instance, for example, I, 
um, doing podcast notes for this session of podcast recording. I Yesterday, I was doing all artwork and stuff. So I couldn't even like put in notes until this morning. <laughs> like I literally have to like have like an overnight shift for me anyway. Um, so it, it's definitely a matter of like switching gears, but like giving yourself the space to do that. And I know I need like a full day to switch gears. Like it's really hard for me to switch gears in the middle of the day or like do an hour of biz bash work and an hour of KMO day. Like I need to do full days. So that's just something that's worked for me. And then in terms of timing and scheduling, we kind of plan out our big launches for the year. Um, in January, we're trying to keep a, a loose schedule, I guess. It's not like every single day is planned out. We kind of know like what's coming up and what we want to do this year. We're still flexible with it, obviously, because we like do whatever we want. And I'm part of the business, so I just make things flexible. <laughs> but um, So having that is really helpful in terms of my other schedule and how many brides I want to book or like when I want to focus on, you know, going on vacation or anything like that. So it all just kind of comes down to those things. But for me, compartmentalizing is like, the way I do it, I guess. <laughs> and I mean that in like a good way, you guys, like just putting things in little boxes, if that makes sense. Yes. And I mean, I'm a big fan of time blocking. So I can switch between doing something creative for my business and doing something for Biz Birthday Bash if I have it kind of written out on my calendar that I'm like, okay, maybe I'll dedicate the morning to this and the afternoon to this. Like that'll work well in my mind if I've gotten up and taken a break and like walked away and then come back to something different. It does get tricky, though, because I find it will bleed in my mind when I check both email inboxes at once. So I'm like emailing some people here and I'm emailing some people here and like, (laughs) there's not very good, like separation of like church and state when it comes to that (laughs) aspect for me. But I definitely agree that there's certain days that I sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm just like, I'm either not touching Biz Birthday Bash today or I'm not touching Eliza Ann Calligraphy because I need to get this one thing done. So for example, Cammie, I like totally just made a note that we need to write our email series for like the contract price raise. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's happening like January 27th through 31st, which will have been way past by the time this episode airs. But I was like, oh, shoot, that was like on our schedule. And like, we just kind of have to check in with each other. And we also have to be okay with the fact that if things like shift and change, that there's grace in that. Because we're the two people that get to freaking decide. So yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, if we want to move something around, we can like, I think our original plan, just as an example for raising the price of our custom stationary contract was to have that like basically switched over once like, 2020 was rung in and we're like nope jokes it has to happen like sometimes later in January like we're not doing that like at the end of the year with like all the holidays and things happening yeah even though I mean it literally would have taken like three seconds but we're like nope we're not doing it (laughs) like I mean theoretically (laughs) yeah yeah we want to be able to send out like emails to people to tell them that it's happening to like give them a good idea that that's it's their last chance to get it for the lower price so yeah, so it's it can be really hard to keep them separated, but I know for me, I'm undergoing like a big shift because I had a lot of resources for creative entrepreneurs on my website, Cami. Like yeah, you yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. Oh yes. So many blog posts, um, a resource page, a free email series, downloadable not freebies, but downloadable items like my wood science course and my Instagram guide and the USPS mailing agreement used to be on my site. Like, yep. <laughs> like all of those things. And I was like, this is too much. I was like, this is way too much. It needs to be separated a lot more than it is. So like I have slowly but surely continued to like transition Eliza and calligraphy as I'm going through this like rebrand and website design so that by the time that launches like basically there won't be any stuff like left for creatives on my site except for the past blog posts like those aren't going to be like deleted or anything um so some of the past blog posts and then I probably will have like one footer that like leads to a resource page of like things but otherwise it's like I want everything to be on, on B&B like that's BBB because that's where we cater to that audience exactly and there's so much more strength in your like advertising when you're catering to one audience instead of two you can do both it's just at a certain point it kind of like gets to be too much yeah agreed I also think too, like when your clients and brides see that you're teaching others in the industry or like creating educational resources for others, they're like, oh, 
they are the expert. I can trust them. So it definitely builds trust in that too. So like, I don't know. I like having both. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's very true. Like, I don't think there's any harm. Yeah, and people knowing that you do both. Yeah, for sure. So, um, okay, shall we move on to part three of this three-part question? <laughs> yes, this part though. <laughs> oh gosh, this is okay. Ooh. Let's just read it again. Um, what do you feel like your true focus when you think about where you want your business to go in the next ten or fifteen years? And this is so funny because, like, Kami and I haven't even talked. 10 or 15 years out I'll be 45 so that's like that's like oh my gosh I don't even know what I'm doing next year yeah that's kind of hard to do because you could literally have like a 12 year old child at that point you know if in the next three years you have a kid like I just got so sweaty (laughs) it's hard to think about this but true focus like Time will tell. <laughs> right now, like, I think Cammy and I feel super invested in both. I mean, I hopefully I'm not alone in saying that because I think there's something that's so fun about being able to do both, like, because it gives your mind, like, a break from the other thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I didn't even, like, think of this question as between my business and Biz Birthday Bash. I was thinking as, like, what's my focus in my business? Like, products versus <laughs> So if that tells you anything, I'm just like, yeah, Biz Birthday Bash is there. So my initial okay. reaction <laughs> was like, didn't even, that didn't even cross my mind. Like I didn't even. <laughs> well, that's so funny because for you, I thought right away, I was like, oh, I bet like products will be like her big focus going forward. I do feel like I'm leaning that direction in the future. Like I don't, I don't see myself being like 50 years old doing invitations. Like if a bride's like, I don't like that. I'd be like, well, too bad you're getting it. Like, I just feel like I'm not going to be. You know what I mean? Like, like I have a kid I have to take to baseball practice now. I don't have time to worry about your flower move, being moved a millimeter to the right. So, like, uh, yes. Yeah, um, exactly. Like, I feel like there is definitely a timeline for both of us probably on the wedding invitation aspect. But I plan on having, like, a good another, like, solid five plus years in me of that because I've, like, committed to that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, and I still have so much building to do in my business. Like, yeah, we're still very like new businesses. You guys, we're not like seasoned experts who have been around for like 20 years. I mean, you know, like we're still, our businesses are like three, four years old. Like, I don't feel like even like reach peak business level till like you're 10 years in your business, you know, and like, you really know what's going on. So yeah, we still don't have everything figured out in terms of that. And like ter- yeah. terms of what I'm doing, I don't even know what I'm doing next year. Like I literally fly by the seat of my pants in my business, but I, I mean that in a way like it's still strategic, but I do just like, uh, I don't know. I, I kind of like leave that freedom for myself. So I don't want to be like, okay, here's my five-year plan. I'm going to do this, 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 and this. Like I, I know it's success and like what my life in terms of what, what I want it to look like. And I'm okay with like, moving the means around of how I get there in my own business, you know, as long as it's still bringing me joy, still glorifying God in a way that I feel like is good with my business and like still serving my clients well. Like that's like the key here and like giving myself time to be with my family. So anyway, this just turned into a whole nother tangent. But No, it's okay. No, I think it's all good. Like I think when I see my future in 10 or 15 years, like I would love to have a letter press by that point. I just like see that being part of my like story yeah. down the road. And I don't know what type of machine it'll be, but I mean, I took that like intensive with Swell Press and I was like, I love this. I love mixing the ink. I love creating the print. I love like doing the plates. I love everything. So even if I didn't do that, like, for profit in the future. (laughs) Like, I think I would want to have one and maybe do like more prints or something else like that with a letterpress. Uh, She basically like sold me on a Vandercook, which is so funny because I thought for so long, like for sure, I would be like a Chandler and Price person. And gosh, it's like the clamshell press. I can't remember like the uh, platen press. That's like the actual name for it. I thought for years that would be me. And then I went to her her intensive and I was like, I love the Vandercook. And I was able to print my 11 by 14 Atlanta map on it, which was like a huge deal because a lot of platen presses don't even have like the space to do something like that. And so it's like, I could see there being some sort of product focus in the future, 
But I will say I've listened to a ton of like proof to product because I love that show. And I think Katie's awesome. And it's funny hearing some of these women that she interviewed like two or three years ago who are now coming back and being like, yeah, so now I'm actually like scaling back on my product business because it got too big. Like, (laughs) yeah, I know. It's wild, right? (laughs) Yeah. So it's like really interesting thinking about that like happy medium and like what does success mean to me and what does that look like? Yeah, But I have to say that I am so passionate about helping other people in their businesses. And I've even joked with like my dad before that I had so much fun doing the stationer summit. Like, yeah, it was stressful, but like, I feel like we did it really well and we had a lot of fun doing it. And I was like, I could see myself like coaching other people how to do something like that, like how to host a summit or do something else like many, many years, like down the road, like this would be like 15 years in the future, you know, when I would like have kids in a family, but I would help other people do some sort of online like summits. And it doesn't matter like what industry, because I think a summit is applicable for any industry. Yeah. Um, That's that's awesome. I didn't even know that was like something you'd be interested in. That's so cool. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. I don't know. And that's the great thing too, about what I'm doing within my business now is like, my dad and I are really trying really hard to get ElizaAnn.com. By the point this launches, we will know whether or not we have it. It's been a whole thing. Um, (laughs) But by having that name and that domain, I can kind of like become anything I want, which is really like freeing almost because like, think about like five or 10 years down the road, if I wasn't doing calligraphy or invitations anymore, I could still have elizaann.com. It could just shift to being more about me or I could get like elizabethyoung.com or something like that. But yeah. I don't know. It, it. I will say one of the things for me though, as I've thought about things, when I do have kids, I know that I want to be able to take some sort of like good maternity leave or like really, really focus on them for the first couple of years. So that is interesting for me to think of from a business perspective. Like, I don't think I'm going to want my business to go away completely, but like, what is that going to look like if I want to be like really present with my kids? Yeah. And that's why I think there's like, would be a shift away from wedding stationery because it's so hands-on, so like such a high touch service to have. So like products are just so much more low key and laid back, um, you know, like I do both and I like the product side for me is like more relaxing. It's just fun. I enjoy packing up stuff. Like that's something I can do and it's not like overwhelming. And I can easily like hire someone to do those things too. So it's just like a lot more hands off. So I feel like I could, you know, shift my focus to that when I do have kids in the future, which is terrifying to think about, but also really exciting. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I totally get mixed feelings about it now because it's one of those things I, I think we're currently watching everyone else in the world like get pregnant or be pregnant or have kids. And so it's hard to like not think about it to some degree when it's like happening to everyone around you. I joked the other day with my accountant that it was like the disease that was spreading really quickly. Obviously, I'm joking. Being pregnant is not a disease. Having children is wonderful. But it was like that I just feel like there's something in the water. All happens at once. <laughs> it's just the stage of life we're in. We're like in our late 20s now. And so that's when everybody is starting their families. So it's crazy. It's yeah, it's weird to like think outside the box and think of what things will look like at that point. But I am really glad I've been able to start my business prior to that. Um, I commend all of you guys who have like started businesses after having kids and fit that piece into the puzzle. <laughs> Cause at least I can go like, I can reverse engineer it a little bit. Right. Like, yeah, like that, that is know. like my motivation for growing my business now and building like a really strong foundation is like, so I can have time with my kids when I become a mom. Like I really want to be <laughs> very hands off. So You know, that is that like motivates me to like figure out the systems and where I want to be, like, kind of thing. So, I don't know. Anyway, you guys, this has been like a very intense (laughs) QK. All good things for sure. I mean, Kami and I had a super intense conversation before this. So, it kind of makes sense that we got really like, um, (laughs) like into it. (laughs) I know. Just an emotional day. (laughs) Oh, Lordy. Once I start. I just don't stop. It's super great. Yeah. And I'm like, can I take the bite of my corn dog now? <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? 
Oh, yeah. I think you've said something like that before. It makes me laugh every time. <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, anyway, you guys, now we're ending this on a super weird note. Um, but it's all good. So when is this coming out? Is this in February? Oh, no. This one at this point will be in March. March 3rd. What? That's crazy. I'm probably snowboarding right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you might be. You have two ski trips this year you I lucky know, dog i know so probably snowboarding right now in two days it'll be papa g's 71st birthday so that's exciting um yeah all right that's exciting <laughs> oh it's a january birthday i always forbid no, because we had march because this is so, you said this is march 3rd so his oh oh my gosh i, I am like, thinking I- in the future you're thinking in the future, two days from the day this airs, it's Pop's birthday. Yeah. I was like so confused. I was like, what? His birthday's not in January. I, I see. I see where you're going. You see what I'm doing? So now we have to make sure this airs on March 3rd or I'm going to look like an idiot. So Don't worry. It's for sure happening on March 3rd. Our cue and cake episodes don't move like at all. So anyway, you guys, if you want to ask us more questions on Q and cake and get us all emotional and thinking about the future and children and babies and oh my word, um, you can just go to bizbirthdaybash.com slash Q and cake and ask your questions there and it can be anything. Clearly we will answer it. So <laughs> leave us a question and we will answer it in our Q and cake episodes that happen every five weeks, six weeks, four, every five weeks, every five weeks, <laughs> uh, like clockwork. <laughs> anyway and don't forget to leave us a rating and review because it helps us so much we love you guys we love you we'll see you next time bye (laughs) bye y'all know we are big on protecting your booty and your biz so we want to tell you all about our secret weapon for mailing invitations for your clients the usps mailing agreement It takes the personal emotions out of stressful situations and lets your clients know exactly what will happen when their invitations go out the door and it covers you in case anything goes wrong, which let's be honest, it probably will. I mean, we love you USPS, but you cry, okay? (laughs) (laughs) Honestly, we've kind of realized that putting a small shipping clause in your contract just isn't enough. Trust us, we know from experience, there are just too many things that can go wrong when mailing. Things like... Ripped flaps scuffs and scratches mishandled envelopes postage snafus lost invitations never to be seen again and rabid overprotective dogs okay that well, was a little bit of a stretch a little yeah, bit, yeah a little bit. okay <laughs> anyway the point is all of these are things that you cannot control so why leave the burden of fate up to the united states postal service protect yourself with our mailing agreement so your client understands exactly what could happen to their invitations in the mail and how those situations are handled if you've been scared to mail on behalf of your clients this is the tool you need to add that next level service to your stationary biz Go to bizbirthdaybash.com forward slash shop to purchase your copy today at 97 bucks. This is a steal. Seriously, you can't live without it. It's true. Go get it now.